All right, so I want to continue the um, series about um, quantum mechanics in the presence of periodic potentials. Um, what I want to show you now is a little example problem. It's actually a pretty classic problem in just about every textbook um, that shows you that um, even the simplest forms of periodic potentials give rise to so-called band structure, um, relationships between, which basically means the relationship between wave vector for a um, traveling wave and the energy. Um, we've seen this in the context of free electrons so far, but what I'll show you is that once you introduce periodic potentials, you generate more complicated energy versus um, wave, uh, wave vector relationships. So the classic problem setup is called the chronic penny model. Um, it's meant to basically be a very crude model of what happens um, to electrons that are attracted to nuclei in a material. Um, so the basic setup is that what we're going to do is construct a square wave potential. Um, and so the, basically there'll be points where the potential is very low, so zero. Um, and there'll be points in the field where the potential is high. So the electrons are more likely to be in the low energy locations, the low potential locations, and they're less likely to be in the high um, potential regions. Um, and so if I think about it, like I can sort of pretend or close my eyes and think about this, like pretend there's like a nuclei, um, a positively charged nuclei that's sitting in the middle of the, um, the zero portion of the square wave potential. So it's attracting the electrons and pretend like further away from the nuclei, it's less likely that an electron will be there. Of course, in real materials, it's not a square wave. There's some complicated periodic potential, but it turns out that the math is a lot easier to do when you have a square wave potential. So this is a good way to start. Um, and so um, we'll parameterize that square wave potential using um, two length scales, B and A. So A describes how much of the periodic potential is zero, and B describes how much of it is whatever this other constant value is. Um, so let's call that constant value V zero. So in the, I mean, it doesn't really matter exactly how what you give the phase of this square wave potential, but um, to make the math a little bit easier, what I'll do is um, I'll set it up so that the high portion of the potential goes from negative B to zero um, on an absolute x-axis, and the low portion goes from zero to A. So it's a square wave potential, and it's um, because it's repeating, that means that it has the property that the square wave is self-coincident if I displace the, um, the original potential by a value r, which is essentially the translation vector. Um, in, in this case, r is a plus b. So if I'm, I can't tell the difference between something that's happening here and something that's happening here is all that says. The potential is the same. Okay, so let's go through the solution to Schrodinger's equation. It's actually not terribly too hard. We've actually seen this before. Um, not together, but we've seen each individual portion separately, right? So in the region where the potential is zero, Schrodinger's equation doesn't have a potential associated with it. And so the solution in that region would be given by solving this equation. And we already know that that gives wave, um, you know, um, what do you call it, uh, wave functions that are just um, exponentials that involve complex numbers. So this is a one, there's one portion that involves a constant that is um, positive and another one that is negative with an imaginary number in between, meaning, meaning that these are oscillatory solutions. Um, if you add, oh, um, yes, and, and if you have an add a potential, that actually doesn't change. That's actually still true. Um, I'll call this a different constant though, because um, if you try and work out what these constants are that sit up here, they are related to the energy. Um, and so um, without a potential, it's just square root of 2m times the energy divided by h bar squared. If I add the potential, all that does is basically changes, like basically you just need to take the difference between the electron energy and the whatever the value of this potential is. Um, so we actually know what the separate solutions are, but then the, the only thing that we really have to do in order to turn this into like a 
more like a, a generally valid solution is apply some boundary conditions on here to make sure that these wave these two wave functions meet up. Um, so we've got what one, two, three, four unknowns here, A, B, C, and D that are sitting in these two wave functions. And I'd like to patch them together by applying some boundary conditions. So um, the first two, so that basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply boundary conditions that apply at wherever these two wave functions inter intersect with one another. So that would be here and here. So that's at x equals zero and x equals a. Um, and in order to get four boundary conditions, what we'll do is we'll ask that both the wave, the value of the wave function and the derivative of the wave function be continuous at these connections. Um, I'm not sure if you've come across it yet. Usually I give a homework problem out to explain why the wave, the derivative of the wave functions have to be continuous. Basically it has to do with the probability flux. Um, so in other words, like if I was to think about the, the derivative basically represents the momentum associated with the, um, the electrons and that momentum needs to be continuous across the boundary um, because momentum is also kind of related to the current um, that an electron would carry. So um, it turns out that not only the wave function itself needs to be continuous across these boundaries, but also the derivative. Um, so we'll apply those two conditions, easy enough. So let's do it. <clears throat> so the easy boundary condition to apply is at x equals zero. Um, the first two are pretty easy, so all we need to do is say that the wave function, if I am uh, just on the left side of this interface, is equal to the wave function if I'm just on the right side of this interface. And if you check out what the two solutions for the wave function were, and you you know apply that boundary condition, you'll just find that the two unknowns c plus d have to be equal to the two unknowns a plus b. Um, and then you can apply the the uh, derivative boundary condition as well. And the only thing that that does is since, since the solutions were um, exponentials that involve complex numbers, all that does is it, it basically kicks out prefactors that involve the constants. So like in, the, in this area over here, that involved e to the i q's. So um, that basically, when I take the derivative, that basically brings down factors of i times q. Um, and in the other region over here, that kicks down a factor of i times k. Easy enough. There's our there two first equations. The last two equations are a little bit more tricky because our solution technically, so our solu so we'd like to be able to apply a boundary condition here, um, but the problem is that the wave function that we solved for didn't actually exist in here. We solved for the wave function that was over here, but I need to apply the boundary condition here. So um, in order to do that, that's actually super easy. We'll just use Bloch's theorem. So Bloch's theorem says that, um, well, if I, if I know the potential in one location, like over here, I, or sorry, not the potential, if I, if I know the wave function over here, I can figure out what the wave function is over here just by applying Bloch's theorem. So I know what it is here, and I can figure out what it is here. Um, so all I need to do is multiply by a factor of e to the i k r. Uh, what's k? This is a little k. This is a little. It's important to note that this is actually kind of a. At this point, it might actually seem like a fudge factor. Um, so this is this is little k. This is different than the big k that's up here. That's the most important thing to notice here. And I'll and it'll turn out actually that this little k actually represents the wave vector of the block wave but we don't necessarily know that yet. So just hold on to that thought. Um, so um, right now you can just think about this as just another unknown that has entered the problem. Okay, so let's let's apply that um, the, the block condition. So the first condition was that I would like the, oh, I guess I didn't draw a picture here. I would like the wave function to be continuous across here, meaning that um, X on the left side of A should be equal to um, the wave function evaluated over here at um, just just to the right of x equals a. Um, and so that's not directly available. We'll just use the block theorem. So all we need to do is basically figure, so to figure out what that was supposed to be, all we need to do is take the solution that was over here and translate it, you know, one, one translation vector away. So we'll take that solution and we will translate that one um, one translation distance to the right using Bloch's theorem. 
So that gives us an equation. So if you actually evaluate that, this term gives you a equal a e to the i k a plus b e to the minus i k a. That's this term. And then the second term, so this thing itself was c e to the i q b plus d e to the i q b. That's this. Um, and then the phase factor that is associated with Bloch's theorem appears here. So that gives us our third equation. So now we've got one equation, two equations, three equations um, for the unknowns A, B, C, D. And actually now we've got this thing, little k, running around up here in the exponential. Um, so you can use Bloch's theorem again to calculate the last boundary condition that involves the derivative. I won't show that, but it's pretty easy to show that all it does is basically kick out a factor of i k. Um, Sorry, just wondering whether I just noticed that I may have missed a sign here. So the derivative should kick out a minus sign here and here that I think I missed. Um, but either way, you'll, you'll get four equations and four unknowns um, for the unknowns a, b, c, d, and little k currently appears to be a free parameter. Now, there's only like one little problem with that, which is that, okay, big k and q, so that's like, this big K and this big Q, if we think back, those are actually functions of energy, right? So these can be traced back to the energy associated um, with the Schrodinger equation. So I can think about these equations a little bit differently. I've got four equations. There's actually, if you look at it carefully, there's like all the terms involve either A, B, C, or D. Um, these are basically a linear set of equations um, but there are, there is no basic, there's no portion of the equation, like if I'm thinking about this as a linear set of algebraic equations for A, B, C, and D, there's actually no right hand side, like, ever, like, which implies that there are no solutions unless the determinant associated with the prefactors to A, B, C, and D, so unless that determinant is zero, there are no solutions to this. Um, so if the if the determinant has to be zero, that actually puts some conditions on what the allowable relationship between energy and K is allowed to be. Basically, that gives you an algebraic equation for E versus K. Let's see how that plays out. So if I take the determinant, um, okay, so in case it wasn't completely clear, um, the way that you would think about doing this is everything that's on the right-hand side over here, I can move all those terms over to the left-hand side, just subtract A here and subtract B here. So then I would have like minus A minus B plus C plus D. So if I think about that as a linear equation, like a linear set, if I think about these as a linear set of equations, that would be minus one times A plus minus one times B plus one times C plus um, one times D equals zero. So that actually just describes basically a a row of a matrix, minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, you know, as, as the, the top row of a matrix. Anyway, so I can do that for all these equations and then require that the determinant of that matrix be zero. And if I do that, what I'll find um, after some rather annoying math um, is that you end up with this equation. So um, I've moved the term that involved little k over to the right-hand side for reasons. Um, so basically you have a term that looks like q minus q squared plus k squared divided by 2kq um, equals something that involves sine of q times sine of ka, another term that involves the, sine, the cosines of the same things. Um, and then the right hand side can be made to look like cosine of little k times a plus b. So this is the total um, you know, this is the total dis the total lattice vector or whatever you want to call it um, associated with the unit cell for the potential. So this is kind of, I mean, this is a kind of weird equation. I don't know it, that it's analytically solvable. I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, typically in undergraduate textbooks, oh, let, let, me, let me just point this out. Okay, so just let's, let's just back up and figure out where am I going with this. Okay, remember that Q and K, these like big Q and big K, these things are functions of energy, 
right? Basically, if I could tell you the energy, then I'd be able to tell you what the value of Q was or, or equivalently the value of K. Um, so what I'm really looking to figure out here is I can flip it one of two ways. If I know the energy of the, um, of the electron, then I should be able to figure out the value of little k in that case. Um, usually it kind of works the other way around, which is if I know the value of k, so that's equivalent to knowing like the wavelength of the block wave, or if I, if I specify a wave vector of the traveling wave, then what energy is associated with that? I can run that either way. So this is, I can think about this equation as a relationship between energy and wave vector of the block wave. Um, and it's hard to solve for algebraically. In fact, I think it's actually impossible. Um, there are some tricks. So if you read like a undergraduate solid state textbook, almost all of them, um, essentially what they do at this point is they take the limit of, um, you know, basically, uh, what do they do? I guess they normally take the limit of B goes to zero and I guess uh, Q goes to infinity. Essentially what they do is they, they are trying to like turn it into from a square wave into a series of delta functions. And then it turns out that you can take a limiting form of this equation and make some algebraic process, but you still can't solve the total thing. However, I'm going to show you a little trick. So I'm going to do this the easy way so that I can do some plotting right away and not let's not worry too much about the algebraic solving procedure right now. Um, so I'm going to view this as a contour plot. Um, so here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to pretend like this equation up here is actually like a um, something that looks like z equal, you know, the, the height of something is a function of x and y. And, you know, generally the way a contour plot works is that I'm looking to plot the point or plot the lines where this function is equal to a constant. And in this, con and in this context, I'm going to show you that that constant is equal to zero. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this equation up here. Um, why don't I just, I'm going to subtract this cosine Ka plus B back to the other side. So this thing minus this thing describes a function. It's a function of energy, right? The energy exists inside Q and K. It's a, that thing would be a function of energy and a function of k, and I know that in order to be a solution, that would have to, you know, we're looking for the places where that function is equal to zero. Um, so I'm looking to plot a contour, a very specific contour, where this function is equal to a constant of zero as a, you know, varying the values of e and k. So, um, and this is just my little note here. So this is the function that I'm talking about. And um, the functions Q, and, or the, the things Q and capital K are direct functions of energy that we know. Um, so basically, we're just going to make a contour plot. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use MATLAB. And uh, I'm going to ask it to plot the specific constant f equals 0. Boom. OK, so this is how this is the basic idea for the, the code that does this. Um, so this is my chronic penny model. I'm going to choose a lattice constant, like the total lattice, lattice constant A plus B will be like, you know, 2.5 angstroms. I'll, for, for the sake of argument, I'll just assign half of that to A and half of that to B. So it's a truly a square wave with equal, equally sized things. Okay, so um, what I'll show you is that, um, okay, so it's actually pretty clear to me that I don't need to plot anything beyond pi over a. Why do, Why is that true? Well, um, or sorry, uh, pi over the total lattice constant, so that's a plus b. Why do I know that? Well, look at this. This function is periodic, right? So like, um, how, how do I put that? Like, the if I, if I translate a distance a plus b over, I'll just basically repeat all the value more. If I, if I translate more than that, I'll just end up repeating the values of this over and over again. And so like, I don't really have to go to larger values of K beyond, I only have to do basically the central period, like one period of this function will capture all of the possible behavior of what can happen here. Because if I just go to larger values of K, it'll just keep happening over and over again. So um, I'm gonna only plot up to, oops, I don't wanna give it away. I'm only gonna plot up to a value of pi over a lat. So that's, um, 
basically, basically, yeah, anyway, that's fine. Um, so I'm only going to plot for a central period, um, or at least I only need to. Um, and the associated energy with that, um, oh, I'm going to do something a little bit weird here. So to avoid having to write, so truly, I need to, like, you know, energies have units of, you know, like, h bar squared over 2m. Um, and so, like, I'm going to just write things out in an energy, like, in an energy scale that just automatically has that built in, so I don't have to keep typing that out. Um, I don't know. I, I, I basically figured that, you know, add a value of, like, I don't know, maybe, like, 16 times as high as k max squared, I would cut it off. You'll see that I, what that does is it allows me, to, like, since we're going to end up finding that there are multiple energy bands, this just allows me to plot multiple energy bands. Um, I'll generate a bunch of k values. So that's this little k. I'll generate a bunch of k values. And even though I said that this was the maximum one that I would have to do, uh, just to show you what happens if you don't cut yourself off there, I'll actually go maybe four of those in each direction to the left and right. Um, and um, similarly, since I'm making a contour plot, I'm going to have to specify which k values and which e values. Um, and so for energy values, I'm going to go from zero, which would be the lowest energy possible, up to this value of e max, which is kind of arbitrary. Um, mesh grid just is a trick that allows me to create a grid for doing plotting using um, MATLAB's contour command. So basically, I generate a, a bunch of vector values of k and e, and then generate a bunch of like a grid, like a matrices, matri two matrices of corresponding values of k and e. Um, and then basically, I just need to write out the chronic penny model. So um, I don't know. So like you can you can really choose the size of the potential to be anything you want. Um, in this case, just to make the scales kind of similar, what I did was I I chose the potential scale to be similar to the energy scale. So like E max was K max squared. So basically the um, I chose I chose a potential strength that was kind of a similar. But you can actually vary this and get a you know play around with like how it changes. But then basically I just calculate so capital K at least in this energy in using this definition of energy scale would be the square root of the energies, and Q would be the square root of the energies minus the potentials um, using this energy scale. Um, and in that case, you can actually write out the values of um, the function. So if I'm thinking about this as a function, Z of you know, X and Y, where um, you know, basically K and energy serve the role of X and Y. So these are the heights. And then I'll just basically do a contour. So I'm um, basically doing. So I'm going to normalize it so that it like you'll see you'll see why I normalize it this way. So I think that the maximum value I should have to go up to for k should be k max. So I'm going to normalize by k max so that things go from zero to one. Similarly, I think that um, you know normally these bands would sort of cut off at k max squared if I didn't have a potential. So I'll just normalize by that so that it goes from 0 to 1 again. Um, and then I'll plot basically contours of the heights. Um, I'll plot the contour that's associated with the value 0. That's what this command means. And then everything else is just formatting. So when you do that, like this is what you get. Um, so essentially, the contour gives you energy versus k. Um, I've normal Again, I've, I've normalized energy in a particular way which is not really required. I, I just did that to make the graph have nice units. Um, but you'll see that basically, like what, what happens when you have a periodic potential is that instead of having, let me see if I, oh, I'll, I'll show you in a second, but um, instead of having just like one energy band that's parabolic, so remember that for a free electron, we got basically energy goes as k squared, and there was no limitation on k at all. It could go from zero to infinity. Um, when you have a periodic potential, there is actually basically what's called the edge of the Brillouin zone. Um, the energy values repeat themselves over and over and over again for larger values of k than that, you know, that one period. Um, and so there's really actually no sense in keeping track of all these solutions outside there because they're just repetitions of the same solution. Um, so 
the, but the other thing that happens is, so remember that like for a free electron, we just had one continuous parabolic band. Well, when you have periodic potentials, what you get is multiple distinct bands. So here's, here's an energy band, here's an energy band, here's an energy band, and there are little gaps in between. You'll see that these two bands don't touch one another. Um, so there are energy values for which there are no possible solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Um, so basically these are the band gaps that, sh these are the so-called energy band gaps that show up in semiconductors. Those exist because there are periodic potentials. Um, so basically like the, the chronic penny model is very simple, but what it shows is that there are these band gaps that show up that um, arise because of the periodic potential. They depend on the strength of the periodic potential. That's basically what determines the size of the band gap. But the, the period of repetition here like, is basically this thing K max, which corresponds you know, to some um, fraction of the lattice constant. So the lattice constant, or like how often things are periodic, determines that periodicity. Like the real space periodicity determines this so-called K space periodicity. Um, and so like everything outside of this first period is basically just a repetition of the same set of solutions over and over again. So basically it'd be like you're double counting the solutions. So what people do is they basically just throw away these solutions that are outside the so-called first Brillouin zone. Um, and they just plot that section. So if you just blow up the section that's in between these two dashed lines, this is normally what you'll see when you go to look up so-called band structures um, for semiconductors. They'll, they'll simply plot um, along the first Brillouin zone. So that's the central zone of K, like the, the wave vector K up until a point, up until a maximum point that's associated with the maximum K vector. Um, which is basically pi divided by the lattice constant in one dimension. All right, so in summary, um, if we think back to what happened before we were working with periodic potentials, electrons could take on ener any energy value they wanted. Um, basically, like depending on what the momentum or the wave vector was, so like the value of k, little k, um, the energy could take on any value it wanted you know, for a free electron. But the second that you apply a periodic potential, like those that actually show up in real solids um, because of the periodic placement of the atoms, um, basically it gives rise to band gaps. And look, like the size of the band gaps depend on the depth of the potential um, or the oscillations in the potential. And um, the band structures in general are far more complicated. Like instead of getting a parabola, you'll get, you know, distinct bands and each band will have its own shape um, that is you know periodic in k um, the, the the wave function k or the wave vector k um, so wave function the wave functions in a periodic potential are always of the block form in fact that's how we were able to um, basically formulate a solution so th there are actually two block forms it's like hard to say what exactly the block form is so the block form that we used to get our solution was this one that said that the wave function itself, like one, one translation vector away, um, could be related to the wave function, you know, one previous translation away times a phase factor that depends on, you know, wave vector and the, how, how much the translation constant is. Um, that's useful for formulating the solutions, but when thinking about what the solution is, um, it's actually, I think, personally better to go back to the other form of the block, um, block form of the wave function, which says that all the wave functions are basically, they are in fact, oscillating waves as a function of x. So these are, you know, e to the i k x, which by the way is exactly the same as the free electron form, um, but times a prefactor that, um, you know, basically is periodic with the periodic of the crystal. So this thing is, does not have, I mean, it's periodic, but its period's kind of arbitrary because you can choose the value of K to be whatever you want. So like it's a wave, it's, a, it's basically like a, a traveling wave, but it's multiplied by like this little, um, this prefactor that's 
got the same periodicity as the um, the crystal itself. So um, these are traveling waves, but they've got some other periodicities associated with them. Um, the, ve the wave vectors k can actually take on any value, just like in the free electron case. It's just that they've got this periodic thing out in front. Um, um, the solutions uh, repeat for every k value that is, you know, a factor of two pi divided by the lattice constant bigger. Um, and so, like when you do the plot, and by the way, that like the zone or the the region between um, that describes essentially the first inner period of k, like between minus pi over a and plus pi over k, that's called the first Brillouin zone. Um, and basically it describes the unique set of solutions that have the lowest k values. Um, there are other schemes for making sure that you don't double count values of k, but this is the most popular one um, that you'll see. Um, so that's called the first Brillouin zone, and usually when people make plots about band structure, the plots will be done only over the first Brillouin zone. Um, and so th that's basically the most important things to understand about um, band structure and where it comes from. The chronic penny model is basically like, it's not a model that I think people actually use to calculate band structures of real materials. It's really kind of a toy model to help you understand like the simplest model that leads to band structure. Um, and so now you've seen it, congratulations.